You join us in Race Control in Alicante, where we've got a packed show to bring you. We've got details of our competition coming up in a little bit. Plus, we're going to be hearing from Blair Took on board Mafre, Carlo Hoosman on board Team Brunel, and also Blethyn Mon from Turn the Tide on Plastic. Not on the boat at the moment, but following very closely from the shore. But first of all, let's give you an update of the competition. Yesterday, we announced a very super prize indeed. And this is what it is you can win. It is one of a kind. It is unique. It is a stopover poster from the start of the race for this edition from Alicante, the home of the Volvo Ocean Race. And we've got all seven skippers to sign it. This is a piece of Volvo Ocean Race memorabilia. Unique. Stands out and is something you will not be able to find in any of the shops. So how do you win? Well, the question that we've got for you is which team, on which day, and at which time is going to be the first boat to cross the equator. The way you enter is you put it into the comments below. And the competition is open now. And it will be open until the first boat gets within 200 miles of the equator, whenever that might be. Now then, this is important. This is how you write the boat that you think it will be. You have to use the hashtag. And you have to use these four letter codes. We can't sift through all the comments. And we can't add them all together. So we have a computer system to do it. This is how it recognizes your answer. You need to start with these hashtags for whatever boat you think is going to be first. Then you add the date, day slash month. Then you put the time in UTC code format. You can enter as many times as you like, multiple times. And if you've got the same answer as somebody else, whoever got there first, they're the ones that are going to win. A fantastic prize, a very simple question. So get yourself into that competition. You can start right now. But meanwhile, let's take a look at what's happening on the race course right now. The tracker is live. It was live for 24 hours. And because we're very special people, it's going to be live for another 24 hours. And if you've been following the show over the last few days, all we've been talking about is turn the tide on plastics. Impressive tactical moves. We said they needed to come down and sit in front of the fleet, and they've done just that. Di Kafari and team are sitting in front of Vesta Selimitha Racing and Dong Fong Race Team. Those three teams pushing out ahead as the whole fleet makes their way to the north. Further back, Team Brunel and Team Axanabel very close together. Mafre behind and slightly to the east, and then Sun Hun Kai Scallywag out on the west. Well, some tight racing, some big pushes going north, and here in the studio in Alicante, I've got Conrad Coleman joining me to talk us through some of the things that are happening out on the race course. But First of all, we want to go back to a little bit of a question that was sent in here. We had Nick Weiss on the show a couple of days ago from the boatyard asking all your questions about maintenance and how these boats are put together. And one question came in from Chad Way asking, what are the rules about using the engine? All the boats have one, but this is a sailing race, right? And as much as Alberto Bolzan would like to use the engine, as he shows here in this clip, I mean, we're not too keen on the teams doing this. The secret to go faster is to have a good engine and a lot of fuel. But don't tell anyone. It's a good secret. Well, Alberto Bozan joking there. We're fairly sure about using the engine to go forward. I mean, how do they use it? What is allowed? Well, first off, we, we know that they don't use the, use the engine at all. We've got a, a, the race, race control here. They use a seal on the transmission. So the, the engine, uh, it operates during, during the course of the race. We've seen other teams get pretty close to sort of running out during the course of some leagues. Uh, but it is, just to be 100% clear, this is a sailboat race. The sailboats uh, advance with the speed of the wind. Um, and it's never, ever, ever used in propulsion. And, and indeed, Alberto, I'm sorry, but as an ocean racing sailor myself, I know that these boats typically go faster with the sails with, with the engine anyway. So we'll put that one to bed. However, the reason that the engines run when the, the boats are at sea is prime, well, is to make electricity. And that is used for the communication systems that they get used to send the incredible images that, uh, that we enjoy on a daily basis. Uh, it gets used for making fresh water uh, with a desalinator plant on board, but it also gets used uh, to, uh, to pump the keel, so the canting keel from side to side, uh, which actually is, is quite an actively trimmed item on board the boat. Now it is, and we want to unpack this a little bit for you here. Uh, first of all, let's play you a bit of a video of it in action. These were some nighttime shots coming in from Mafre, and listen out, you can hear the keel in action. You lift the whole tank for the relay.
Okay, so if you blink, you missed it, but that sort of humming noise there, that's the pump. Well, it's, it's a horrendous screech, actually, <laughs> because uh, Volvo Ocean 65 and, and all of these boats that are made out of carbon fiber are noisy beasts. And so with all of that activity on board, there's no sleeping at all. With the screeching of the winches and the, and the, the howling of that pump, that's for sure. Uh, and so every time the boat tacks or jibes, every squiggle that you see in the tracker, that represents uh, one of the times that that, that howling winch, uh, that howling pump, sorry, has been turned on. Now, you say it was constantly adjusted. We can actually show you this. A couple of days ago, we showed you a clip of Bianca Cook re reflecting on a leg that's going pretty well for them. But take a look at what's happening in the background with the helm and the fingers on the control panel. Have a look at this. When we're constantly, you know, when the lead is changing, you know, when you go from first to last and last to first, being this early in the leg, you can't really get your head too wrapped up in it. I mean, it's awesome when you're at the front. Um, it's nice to see boats behind you for a change. Um, and yeah, it, it does make you feel a lot better about your positions, but you can't get yourself down when you're at the back because, you know, like I said, it's so early in the leg and anything could happen. So there you go. That's how it's controlled with that control panel. And, I mean, clearly, it's something that's adjusted a lot. Uh, yeah, Andy Green, the, uh, the commentator for the import races and the, the starts, uh, he refers to this as driving a car and playing a piano all at the same time. It, it's it's kind of like that, uh, but it does illustrate the fact that this is something that is trimmed all the time, that the sails go in and out, you're sort of twisting or untwisting uh, their position constantly, and, and and the helmsman is trimming the boat as well with that keel. So every time that you, uh, you go into a, uh, sorry, into a puff, and the boat starts to heel over, well, these boats have a very narrow optimum heel angle, so you need to really respect that. And so as the wind comes on, then you add more, more keel, and then as you go into a lull, instead of having the boat sort of sit up and sort of flop about, is that you then ease off the keel, so you maintain the boat on that uh, very specific heel angle. And that's all about going fast in a straight line when it comes down to boat speed, but what about the tactics? What about the navigation? We've seen Turn the Tide on Plastic really absolutely set the standard for this over the last few days. Let's just remind ourselves of what it is that they've managed to achieve. A few days ago, Turn the Tide on Plastic were right next to Vestas 11th Hour Racing. It was around about four miles that they had to play with, and they invested that, sailing out towards the east, hoping that by burning those miles to the eastern side, it would come good, and it did. It was proven to be an absolutely fantastic tactic. Now, Di Kafari and her crew are the most northerly boat, ranked number one, leading this race comfortably with about 17 miles to play with. So a 17-mile lead, I mean, what does that allow you to do? Well, uh, that, that was done by sailing in cleaner wind out to the east, and so, you know, big, big props to them. Great job. And that buffer is really, really crucial because when we looked at the live positions at the very top of the show, we saw that they were sailing a little bit slower than the pack behind. So that uh, buffer that they have at the moment, that allows them to sort of fend off the wolves that are coming from them behind and also gives them a little bit more leeway to work their way around challenges like cloud or to absorb a little bit of a speed deficit. And we're not talking, I mean, when we mention speed deficits, we're not talking necessarily much. We spoke to Charles Cordrella, skipper of Dongfeng Race Team, a couple of days ago, and he thinks the numbers are going to be well, pretty small. We're looking at to be 0 0.1, not faster than uh, 0 to 1, if we can. OK, so there you go, 0 0.1 knots. I mean, half a joke, but half serious. So, OK, let, let's be fair, let's be kind to the boats behind, and let's say that they have a really good run of things, and let's say that they're closing Turn the Tide on Plastic down, maybe going half a knot quicker. How long is it going to take them now that Turn the Tide on Plastic have pulled out 17 miles? Well, if they're going at a, a, you know, a good clip and a half a knot faster um, than Turn the Tide on Plastic, and, and you know, that may well not be the case, but just hypothetically, uh, then that buffer will last a day and a half. But uh, Charles Cordelier there, he was talking about a, uh, tr just trying to eke out a little bit of an advantage about the boats around him. And he, he said that he would be happy with 0.1 of a knot faster than the boats around him. So that, that's good for 2.4 miles per day, which would mean that Turn the Tide on Plastic have about four days in the bank. So, you know, you know swings and roundabouts, we'll see exactly what happens, uh, but it certainly feels good to be at the front. Uh, good to be at the front, but those speed differences are incredibly small. And, and the teams really do obsess about these speed differences. I mean, they've got armies of people on the shore trying to find these little challenges here, ways to go faster.
That's right. Just a little bit earlier, I spoke uh, with Bledenmon, who's uh, part of Turn the Tide on Plastic uh, program, but he's not on board uh, this time round. But he, he's using his previous experience from the America's Cup and his, uh, his performance analysis uh, to help get Turn the Tide on Plastic that winning edge. The eastern route that we took was something that we, we'd actually discussed um, on land uh, before the start. Um, Nico was... Our navigator was quite keen on, on, on pushing east when we could, from basically from the start. Uh, so I think it wasn't necessarily a surprise to see us be doing that, um, although there was a few occasions where uh, I was a little bit cautious with the split that we were doing, but I think they've had a lot of cloud action as well. So happy being a bit further east, a bit further offshore, hopefully staying away from too much of the, of the cloud activity off the Brazilian coast. That leverage, that distance laterally from the rest of the fleet also allowed them to come back over the last 12 to 24 hours and cement that lead as well. Can you talk us through that, that process? I guess most people have seen with it being live on the tracker, kind of we positioned ourselves from being furthest east to now being kind of north of the fleet. So I guess having that position to the east at the beginning allowed us to kind of crack off, sail a bit kind of wider angles, slightly faster angles, um, and also gave us a few more options when the clouds did come over to sail lower, faster modes as opposed to the guys furthest to the west who were forced to sail high uh, all the time. Talk us through the evolution of your team to get to this point now. You're in the lead uh, and you're sailing the boat really, really well. Do you, have, do you think that the sailors on board have the confidence that they can sail exactly the same speed in the same conditions to maintain that lead? Yeah, I think so. I think we've had, I mean, the last three or four legs now, we've, we've shown that we, we can do that. We can kind of battle it there with the best. I guess leaving from Melbourne, we had our kind of first period where we were in the lead, uh, going up to the doldrums. And then similarly going down to, to Auckland, we were in the lead until the very, very kind of latter stages there. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think we have a lot of confidence, um, especially in these conditions. Um, obviously, we'd like a few more miles. I think we'd, everybody would always like a few more miles. So, Hopefully the next kind of 48 hours pushing forwards, we can uh, we can keep eking those miles away. A lot of that confidence that has grown in the team uh, from the beginning of the race to uh, to now has come down to learning the boat, learning the modes, and learning the sail crossovers. Now, on land, you're contributing to the building up that knowledge. Can you talk us through that? Yeah, so uh, one of my roles kind of onshore is to kind of help with the data analysis. Um, and we use all sorts of uh, software uh, to help us with that. And I say one of the key aspects is kind of developing the polar and developing the sail crossover, which both of which kind of give us confidence that we're on the right sail at the right time and doing the right angles and doing the right speeds. So uh, as a new team, kind of we didn't really have that information from the previous race. So kind of throughout this race, we've been building that kind of knowledge base up. And as I say, yeah, we're kind of now getting much more confident in how we trim our sails, uh, when we use which sail. And yeah, hopefully that's kind of showing in the results. Levin Mon from Turn the Tide on Plastic, confidence gaining on the boat about how to go fast. But, you know, Conrad, we talk about these small speed differences that are, we think are going to be out there between the teams. But, of course, you know, we can't ignore a rather large factor, clouds. We've seen it a lot over the last few days. Are we going to see any in the future? Uh, well, absolutely. And, and just to put this in perspective, uh, we saw Charles talking about the point one of a knot and sort of fractions of a knot that you can gain by good trimming and good helming. A uh, good navigation uh, can, can win you tens of miles, as we saw with Turn the Tide on Plastic, but clouds can wipe out all of those gains in one go as well. So let's have a look at what's coming up and, uh, and see what the danger zones are in the next few days. Well, this is where they are now. They're approaching uh, Salvador de Bahia, and they're 160 miles offshore at the moment, but you can see that the routing takes them all the way into the coastline off Recife. Now, this is... Uh, th this is good because it, it sort of sh cuts the corner and heads them off towards Newport, but it's tricky because it brings them into the danger of the local effect. Now, this, this area is not called the tropics for nothing because this is the Amazon rainforest. There's lots of moisture. There's lots of heat. That translates into lots of cloud work all along here. And actually, there's a band uh, of cloud here offshore that typically sits there in the transition between um, the sea breeze and the, and the offshore breeze that we see here. And then right on the coastline, you see uh, there's going to be lots of cloud activity all along there. So really disturbed winds coming up in the future. But then let's have a look a little bit further up to see what is laying in wait for them as well. 
Well, you can see this blue area up here. That's the doldrums. And it looks like we're going to be skirting the worst of it. But remember, as you head up towards the equator, there is a lot of thermal energy as well. This is the true tropics and naturally where this heat and moisture, well, there's going to be clouds again. So all of the hard work that the sailors have been putting um, putting into the boats and into their placings over the past few days and the past few hours, well, they're going to have to do it again and again in the coming days. Well, so it's not all over yet for Turn the Tide on Plastic then. We know that the weather's still holding, uh, you know, a little bit of tricks up its sleeve. And we know how brutal these clouds can be. Mafre, uh, the tracker is live and it's going to be live for the next 24 hours. And if you wind it back a little bit, you'll see Mafre have been dealt an absolutely cruel blow again and again and again with these clouds. We caught up with Blair Took on board and he talked us through what's it like racing through this squally system. Yeah, certainly been a pretty tough night on board Mafre. Uh, some of the worst clouds we've probably seen in the race. Uh, yeah, not great for us, unfortunately. So yeah, pretty tough night, lots of rain. Um, just drying out now a little bit and, and moving roughly towards where we want to go. But uh, yeah, it's been pretty tough. A lot of, lot of slow sailing, a lot of tacking, sometimes jibing. Um, yeah, some really crazy clouds overnight. So yeah, pretty tough one. It seems like when these clouds come over, it really knocks you off the course. How much does the wind and the wind angle change? Oh, pretty dramatically. Uh, you know, sometimes the clouds come and they just give a push, push a breeze and may, you know, lift or, or head you. But then other times, if the cloud's big enough, it will come over, give you a big push a breeze. And when it goes over, it actually, um, you know, gives a reversal because it's that big, and the wind cut and comes from completely the other direction. So you sort of end up jiving over. So that happened a couple of times last night. Um, but because those clouds are so powerful, um, you know, at some stage around them, you obviously get a push a breeze, but then always the lull, or the no wind um, zone sort of bigger than what the gain you get from the, the pusher breeze. So had a few too many of them last night and lost some pretty big miles on everyone else, which was uh, a little bit hard to take considering we're sort of within three miles of Dong Fong just to windward of us and four or five miles to Vestas. So, um, oh well, we'll have to, uh, you know, keep fighting and see if we can get a bit of um, cloud action go our way. And I'm guessing with all this action well into the night, as you were saying, it's pretty difficult to get any rest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, everyone's pretty soaking wet. And uh, Willie and Rob are just down getting some sleep now. They haven't had any sleep all night. And Chubby and Tamara are just about to go down. So, yeah, everyone's really tired on board. But, uh, you know, moving now and it's um, you know, hopefully it can just stay that way and not too many manoeuvres so we can try and catch up on a little bit of sleep. Blair Took on board Mafre, just talking about how rough sailing through these clouds can be. And there's another way really to understand it because we noticed something when we were doing that live X. Uh, the J1 still hanked on. I mean, take a little look at this. Conrad, th th this tells us something, doesn't it? This tells us a lot. It's, it, the fact that this team that has been so known for working themselves to the bone, for seeking out every possible gain, has left a big heavy sail that's filling with water up there on the foredeck and even to leeward is just proof about how variable these conditions are and how hard this team is working. A oh, bit of an interesting sailing mode for Mafre then, ready for anything that we could say here. Certainly seems to be sacrificing a little bit of weight in the right place in order to be prepared for that next squall. They are behind, but still in line with Vesta 11th Hour Racing and Turn the Tide on Plastic. What about Sun Hunkai Scallywag? They, at the moment, are out in the west. They do still have a little bit of a tactical option. It might come good, but so far, David Witt has had to deliver some pretty bad news to his crew. We were 17 miles behind the leader. We're now 24. We're the same, same, basically, with everyone. Small gain on Matrin de Fong and lost to D. So I thought it was going to be worse than that. That's OK. That's great, Woody. Thanks for the update. That's good. <laughs> Thanks, Woody. Good. Great update. <laughs> Take the positives. Well, we're going basically 40 is course. Yeah. Yeah? And then it becomes 350 down the track. So it comes a point where that leverage is going to end up mowing the grass. We just got to not slip back, try not to slip back. Yeah, we don't want it to. And we don't want to try and end up going left, because the less pressure left, more pressure right. right.
So Sun Hunkai Scallywag still trying to see whether that westerly option pays for them as we get nearer and nearer the corner. They are out on their own at the moment, and that's difficult to judge speed. One boat that certainly does have company at the moment is Team Brunel. Team Max and Nobel are right behind them. Just before we came on air, I spoke to Carlo Hussman on board about how close that battle was. We're still um, just, just going for the north, uh, northeast of uh, Brazil, around, around that point, and then uh, into the trade, hopefully going towards the Caribbean. But we're, um, yeah, we got a pretty close battle last night with uh, Team Axon and Belda. They're right behind us now. And uh, they actually passed us about a boat length away uh, towards, uh, towards the stern. That was, um, that was pretty exciting. And uh, they were on the mast there, we were on the jib, so they had to bear away. It was a bit of a squall, so they, they couldn't keep the boat on the breeze anymore, so they had to bear away and go behind us. So that was pretty, uh, pretty cool. Oh, there you go, a very, very cl close battle going on in the water at the moment between Team Brunel and Team Axenabel, mere boat lengths. And, you know, Conrad, so much has happened over the last few days, navigationally, boat speed-wise, and as Carla was alluding to there, you know, they can look at each other. They're learning every single day. They're learning every single day, and as you saw, it is super, super, super tight out there. Just an incredible shot looking at Team Max Nobel over the shoulder of Carlo Hussman there. So that will punish any small difference or any small problem with boat speed. Now, one team that's had a lot to learn in, during the course of this race has been uh, Turn the Tide on Plastic. I spoke with, uh, with Bled and Mon earlier about the analysis and the process that, he, that they go through about how uh, data makes the boat go fast. I also asked him about how you at home, if you're doing uh, the fast net or the Sydney Hobart or, or just uh, sailing around the pond at home, how you can benefit from this kind of experience as well. One of the biggest parts for us uh, in terms of looking at data is, is making sure that uh, it's all kind of calibrated correctly. So even just the, the basics of getting the instruments correct, uh, making sure the wind angles, the boat speeds, it's an endless battle because we know that if that's not right, then none of it's going to be right. So that, that's the same for any sailor. So being confident that your boat speeds are good, being confident that your wind, wind angles are good, um, you're over halfway there. So that's something that uh, any sailor can do. And then, again, for us, we've got a lot of sail choices. Um, it's simplified for most sailors um, with fewer sails to choose from. However, it, again, it's the same thing. You can get it from your kind of sail maker. They can provide you with a basic version, and then you can just go away and, go away and tweak it. Nice. Now, Turn the Tide on Plastic is running a squad system. You're off at the moment. Uh, when you scheduled to be back on the boat? So, yeah, I'm off for this leg, um, and then I'm scheduled, scheduled to be back on for the leg from Newport to Cardiff, so doing the transatlantic, which I'm um, obviously looking forward to, sailing back into my home country, and also the first transatlantic I've done. So it's been a lots of firsts for me in this Volvo, so, um, yeah, really looking forward to joining the team in Newport, hopefully uh, kind of celebrating a, a victory. We'll see. Well... Levin hoping to get back on the boat pretty soon, but what about the competition? We launched this at the beginning of the show and it's gonna run until that first boat gets within 200 miles of the equator. The question was which boat is gonna be the first team to cross the equator on which day and at what time? Let's take a look at the prize. Let's remember this unique, absolutely one of a kind prize. It's a poster from the stopover in Alicante and we have been out there in Idijai, we've given it to the sailors and we've said, you've got to sign this. So seven skippers have penned their names. One of a kind for you. All we ask you to do is write in the comments below on this video or the video tomorrow and keep going forward until that first boat gets within 200 miles. We've had already a, a couple of entries and we're going to pull a couple out here because we want you all to have your fair shot. So if you get the wrong format, our computer system won't pick you up. So have a look at this. Darius Abomatis has put this one in. Fantastic, Mafre, hashtag uh, uh, MAPF. But what day, what time? You've got to include what day and what time. We're not gonna make it as easy as just choosing one boat. We've also had a couple good examples coming in and we've got Christian Bruss who's sent in one here. And that's what we like to see. The right hashtag, the day and the month, and then the time, time in UTC. To remind you of exactly what hashtags that we want, the, take a little look at this. This is all the hashtags for each individual team. It's four letter codes. This is how it breaks down. That is Team Brunel, if you think that Bauer Becking is going to be able to sail their way forward, or is Team Axel Nobel gonna leave the fellow Dutchman behind and push their way to the line? Dongfong Race Team, currently in third at the moment on the race course, could they overtake the boats in front? Mafre, we know they're fast, but they've got many miles to make up at the moment. Sun Hunkai Scallywag out on the west. Could that option work well for them all the way to the equator? 
or is it just turn the tide on plastic? A 17-mile lead right now, and so far, they haven't put a foot wrong. But Vestas 11th Hour Racing are right behind them on the race course, so we'll have to see how that pans out. You have until the first boat gets within 200 miles of the equator to get your answers in. Conrad's going to be back tomorrow with another daily show at 1300 UTC. We're going to be talking more about clouds and the winning moves out in the race course. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.